everyone. It's David Thompson again with Civil War Monitors Behind the Lines. I'm joined today by Kathy Wright, the curator at the Museum of the Confederacy in Richmond, Virginia. So, Kathy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Dave. Happy to be here. Uh, if you don't mind, could you just give us, for some of our viewers who perhaps haven't had the chance to actually get to Richmond, if you could talk a little bit about just what a broad overview of the Museum of the Confederacy. Sure. The Museum of the Confederacy has the world's largest collection of Confederate or Civil War artifacts. We have over 20,000 objects, uh, more than 500 photographs, and more than 100,000 documents. Um, so these really cover not only the Confederate military, but also the, the government and the civilian side of things. So it really offers a wonderful window into life in the South, both before, during, and after the war. Um, and the museum is very lucky that it began collecting in um, roughly the early 1890s. And so it actually received a lot of these items from the veterans themselves or their wives or their children. So, you know, nowadays you might be able to go out and buy a particular Confederate gun, you know, at a, at a Civil War relic show. But you would not know who owned that gun, where it was used, or maybe some, you know, really fascinating story behind it. And now... As a curator, obviously, you have some particular responsibilities there. And I was wondering, you know, if you could share a little bit about what your personal experiences and personal responsibilities are at the museum itself. Sure. I came to the museum about four years ago as a collections manager and have now been promoted to curator. So I've been really fortunate to get to work with the collection in a variety of ways. And for me, it's the stories behind these artifacts and the um, details of the people who use them and uh, how their lives were affected by this phenomenal event that has, you know, really drawn me to um, just really loving to go to work every day. Um, things I might do might range from um, vacuuming the carpets in the White House of the Confederacy or polishing silver over there to... Um, preparing artifacts for a researcher to come in. Uh, they might be a reenactor looking to reproduce uh, some article of period clothing, or they might just be someone who's interested in a particular Confederate regiment. Um, and so we um, are happy to look through our collections in various ways, use different filters to make them available to members and the, and the general public. Um, we also are constantly working on new exhibitions uh, for um, the museum here in Richmond and our new branch out in Appomattox. So um, we also work on identifying objects for loan to other museums and doing all of the necessary paperwork for those um, and other special projects like grant writing or working on online exhibitions. So one of the things I love about the museum is that every day is completely new and different. Now, obviously, we are in the midst of the sesquicentennial, so I'm sure it's very busy for you folks. Have you noticed, have things changed with it being the 150th anniversary, or have you shifted <clears throat> your approach accordingly? Yes, it's very exciting to be working at a Civil War museum during the sesquicentennial anniversary. Um, not only are we seeing increased um, interest from the general public, but we're seeing increased interest from other groups as well, um, such as entertainment. We've had um, any number of Hollywood movies and um, cable television documentary crews who have come to film on site. Um, we're also getting a lot more interest from other museums who are wanting to do um, special exhibitions on the Civil War. So we are lending to places like the Abraham Lincoln Library and, and Museum and the American Textile History Museum and um, all other kinds of places as well. I think we currently have loans to about 30 other museums right now, which is, which is pretty amazing. Um, and we can do that because of our, our phenomenal collection. Um, but it's... Um, it's very interesting. I do hope that the public, in learning about the war during this 150th anniversary, does continue to um, want to learn more so that um, after 2015 that we continue to see more visitors and more um, interest from the general public. Now, I'm going to say that our viewers want to know more, but to be honest, it's mostly me. I want to know more as well. <laughs> Who in the world of Hollywood have you had come through uh, the Museum of the Confederacy as of late? Um, I gave a tour to a crew of about 12 people um, about two years ago. Uh, so this would have been back in the winter of you know, 2010. Um, and it was only after I gave a tour of the White House to this group and they were leaving that someone 
on, on the MOC staff came up and whispered, did you know that that was Steven Spielberg? <laughs> and I said, no, I didn't. And I immediately rushed over to the window. And of course, then I recognized him. Uh, he wasn't wearing his, his trademark baseball cap. Um, but we also had Daniel Day-Lewis come through because he was portraying Lincoln in the movie that Spielberg did ultimately film. Um, so those have probably been our, our two biggest name visitors who have come through recently. And obviously the Lincoln movie is coming out uh, shortly. Uh, yeah, and, very, and, very exciting. <laughs> yeah, so much of it was filmed in Virginia. So uh, very exciting for Civil War folks to see Spielberg put a, a Lincoln movie out there with Daniel Day-Lewis. Um, you did mention uh, the new Appomattox Museum. I wondered if you could share a little bit more about uh, what that actually is with some of our viewers who maybe haven't had a chance to get out there just yet. Yeah, I would, I would love to tell you more about our, our wonderful new museum out in Appomattox. Um, it is basically a new branch or another off-site gallery for the Museum of the Confederacy, and we hope that it'll be our, the, the first of a series which will open throughout the state of Virginia. And it's the largest uh, project to commemorate the Civil War during the the sesquicentennial. So we spent, you know, more than $8 million to build a brand new facility out there. The building includes a large permanent exhibition space as well as a uh, slightly smaller temporary exhibition space. Um, it also has a, um, a large meeting room, um, which is a facility that the uh, Park Service folks up, up the road do not have. So that was a really wonderful um, opportunity for the town because uh, now basically the museum um, of the Confederacy and Appomattox has a wonderful partnership and relationship with the National Park Service of Appomattox Courthouse. Um, and so now people can go to the actual place. But if you've been to the place, you'll notice there aren't that many original artifacts which are on, on, on display. Um, so people can now come to the new MOC Appomattox and see more than 300 original artifacts, um, dozens of more original and, and reproduction documents. And, um, being a brand new facility, we had a lot of opportunities to work in newer technology, new interactive games, uh, touch screens. It's a really wonderful way for the public to not only learn about the war, but to really interact with these artifacts and dig pretty much as deep as they want. And I, and I do know uh, that technology also extends into the world of dealing with artifacts. Um, at the at the MOC. I was wondering if you could share some of the new technology that you have at your disposal um, as you're looking at some artifacts that didn't exist even, say, 10 years ago. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the museum uses technology in a variety of ways to learn, to learn more about the collection and to make it more accessible. Um, it's made my life easier on a daily level just having a computerized database where I can cross-reference various things. Um, but it's really been amazing what it's helped us to uncover about a lot of these artifacts. Um, starting back um, in the 60s and the 70s, we began doing work with um, submitting particular hair samples from the collection for analysis. In fact, we were able to help a researcher who had a theory that John Wilkes Booth may have been poisoned with arsenic. So we, we did that back in the 1960s. And since then, as new technologies have become available, we've been very fortunate that even though we don't personally own um, much of this equipment or really any of it, that we've had um, very friendly people who have offered to uh, let us do various tests. Um, so we... We um, several years ago had a battle flag conserved and there was a large stain on the central portion of the flag. And um, the story behind its capture was that a Confederate soldier had basically died, um, you know, falling on it to help protect it. And so it became um, a question as to whether the stain could actually be blood. And so we did a, a test and sent it away to a lab, and they were able to confirm that the stain was human blood. So, you know, that's a very real, tangible kind of, um, kind of thing to be able to learn from that scientific test. Um, more recently, um, back in 2009, we took two dolls from our collection, which have uh, similar histories of having been used to smuggle medication through the blockade during the war. And we first had them x-rayed to confirm whether um, they were constructed in a way that would have allowed the medicine to be hidden inside of them. And um, it turns out that that's absolutely possible. And um, their hollow head and shoulder portions would have provided an ideal uh, place uh, for Confederate 
uh, generally civilians, to hide medication, to slip through the um, cracks in the blockade in various ways. Um, and then we, um, in working with the uh, PBS history detectives, were able to have the dolls forensically tested and um, used a very uh, high-tech machine that analyzes chemical compounds to tell you what, what they're made of. And unfortunately, we didn't find any traces of quinine or morphine inside of our dolls, but it was a really fun process anyway. Um, and we um, also have opened a um, little message um, that was sealed up inside of a bottle that was sealed for more than 147 years before we opened it, and finally were able to read its contents, which it turned out were written in a secret code. So we had cryptologists help us break this secret code and read a message that um, had been intended to be delivered to General Pemberton inside of Vicksburg on July 4th, 1863, which famously is the day that Vicksburg was surrendered to the Union Army. Um, so it was a wonderful insight into um, a really extraordinary chapter of Civil War history and a very pivotal time. Now, as a museum, you're always looking ahead as well, even though you're dealing with things from the past. So uh, any future exhibits that you can share with us for the Museum mm -hmm. of the Confederacy? Absolutely. We are uh, currently working on an exhibit for the MOC in Richmond, which is going to open early next summer on Pickett's Charge and we will be um, pulling all of the flags out of our collection that were captured at, Pick at, uh, at Pickett's Charge, and we will be um, putting them on display together for the first time in many years, um, as well as many other um, wonderful artifacts from our collection, including some terrific new um, recent donations of photographs of soldiers um, and their pension applications and uh, letters that they wrote home on, on, on the retreat back from Gettysburg. Um, we also are working on a new exhibition that will open at the MOC in Appomattox in the next year or two on veterans. Uh, we have uh, an amazing collection that spans not just the Civil War, but also the um, post-war and antebellum periods. So we really have a lot of stories that we're looking to be able to tell for the first time, which includes the stories of what happened to these uh, men who had fought for four years, but then went home to live for decades more. Um, how did they make do? How did they move forward? What were their beliefs? And um, how have their actions in the post war years continued to impact us and our understanding of the war today? So um, we're really um, very excited about working with the collection to uh, help help to tell a lot of these stories. Um, another exhibition, which is in the planning stages, is one on children during the Civil War, which I think is a, a, an aspect that would interest a lot of people who might not think that they care very much about the military side of things, um, and so could really open up the story of the war to um, you know lots lots of more modern people today. Now, as a curator, you know what type of goals do you have in sharing this war with the general public? Um, it's it's tricky. We live in a world with you know wonderful technology at our fingertips, um, and you have to obviously reach an audience um, and get them inspired about a war. And for some, that there's a lot of passion for it. But for others, you're always trying to obviously increase your audience. So, what type of goals do you have as a curator of the MOC uh, to really and try to get more people interested in the war? <clears throat> I I know that a lot of people see history as kind of a dry, dusty collection of facts and dates, um, but I see it more as stories of people who um, were, you know, in many cases, just like you and I, but lived through, in this case, very extraordinary circumstances and had to make very difficult decisions about sometimes just how to live day to day and sometimes about larger issues, about their stance on freedom. Um, and um, it states rights. So there are issues large and small that are tied up in the study of the Civil War, and I hope that by teaching people to look closely at an event like the war, that we can also teach people to be more careful thinkers in their day-to-day -day lives. Well, Kathy, thank you so much for joining us. Again, this is Kathy Wright, curator for the Museum of the Confederacy uh, in Richmond. And obviously, as she mentioned, they do have a new museum as well in Appomattox for those of you who haven't had a chance to get there. 
I hope you can get to both. I personally haven't been to Appomattox yet, but I would love to get to it. Uh, but I can speak uh, about Richmond, and it's absolutely fantastic. So if you are in the area, you do need to stop by and see it. Uh, and it's a great museum, and this is coming from a northerner, so you know I really mean it. Uh, Kathy, thank you so much for taking a little bit of time to speak with us today, and uh, hopefully we can have you on again soon to talk about more exhibits and more exciting stuff coming out of the MOC. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity.